Okay, so in the, the guide there it says that I was going to talk about hip fractures, but uh, I would talk past Dr. Bob's last uh, presentation if I talked about every nuance of every hip fracture there is. So I decided to pare it down to femoral neck fractures, and I do have to say that I left out even some femoral neck fractures. I left out uh, one omission for sure is femoral neck stress fractures, but we can leave that for a talk for those that are deciding to join in the next training to be in the next Spartan War and one of the uh, possible complications of that. Um, femoral neck fractures, well, no disclosures that said that on the other ones, are a big part of uh, monetary spending in this country at this time, and it's going to exponentially increase throughout the years, they say it's going to increase twofold in the year 2050. Right now, the incidence of hip fractures is not linear, but it goes up with age. Uh, right now, North America has the highest percentage of hip fractures in the world. Now, there are certain regions that have actual higher incidence of hip fractures, including Norway and Sweden, where it reaches about 400 per 10,000. Uh, here in the United States, it's roughly for women, it's roughly about 32 per thousand, uh, so a little less. But in general, North America has the most uh, hip fractures uh, uh, anywhere in the world. Um, there's significant mor morbidity, mortality, and expense. And of course, expense is a big thing in healthcare these days. Uh, always wanting to increase quality and decrease cost in everything we do. So bimodal distribution, and this is kind of where this talk is going to go. It's going to be a dichotomy of the type of uh, hip fractures or femoral neck fractures that there are. One is the elderly, and when I was looking this up, apparently you're not supposed to use that term. You're supposed to say older persons, according to the World Health Organization, when I was reading up on their 2010 guidelines for femoral neck fractures. So I apologize. Um, but elderly, of course, it's decreased bone mineralization. Uh, along with other things that we'll go through with risk factors. And then young, high energy trauma, usually males, um, that are going to have that type of femoral neck fracture. Uh, risk factors. So increasing with age, greater than 50, two times the risk. Now that instance I was telling you about, it's not linear, it's exponential. Those that are 90 to 94 uh, have a significant increased risk compared to those 60 to 65. So 60 to 65 has a 2.2 in females. This is 2.2 uh, uh, incidence for it versus 90 to 90 plus, uh, where you're looking at 40 plus incidence, uh, and this is per thousand. So male um, weight loss uh, is actually contributed to this in, uh, with aging. Osteoporosis. Uh, I think the picture that you can most fit in your head is that those that are thin, lighter skinned, female in northern latitude, which I'm sure we know nobody like that in this region whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so significant morbidity and mortality uh, with these. Uh, so the one year mortality, 12 to 36 percent, high mortality within the first four to six months after the fracture. By one to two years, it does go back to age uh, mash controls. But in that early phase, there is a significant morbidity and mortality uh, for these patients. Um, why? Well, you usually just kind of glare by these slides and think, okay, that's a stat. But these are things that we actually, uh, any, any one of us that deal with hip fractures, we actually do counsel the patients, uh, family on this most of the time, uh, where we will actually tell them, listen, this is a bad issue. Um, said person is 80, 85 years old, and they come in with femoral neck fracture or femur fracture. You do sit down and counsel them and say, listen, this is who I can fix this fracture. We can get her through this little part, but there is X, Y, Z complications that occur in the first year, and this is not out of the woods just because we operate. So that's a big part of uh, what we do to counsel both the patient and the family when we uh, have patients with this. Um, delayed surgery, it's going to come up a few different times. I'll talk about that here in different uh, areas. The mechanics of the hip, I just, I didn't go in depth, but of course anything to do with the human body and orthopedics is very based in physics. Uh, tensile compression forces, the amount of forces going across that, I think Miranda had Newton's many times in her slides, and I mean that is how the body and the joints work, and bone and compressive load. Four times, just in daily activity, four times your body weight is what the hip joint sees, and in other joints it's even more than that. So. Uh, the, the physics of it gets right down to it. Just us right now as we walk around, 
four times your body weight is going through your hip joints. So as you can see, as you become elderly, more frail, as you lose weight, um, lose bone mineral mineralization, it becomes a big problem then when you're seeing that type of load across the joint. Uh, blood supply, this is uh, very important when it comes because most of these fractures we're talking about today are intracapsular fractures. So they're, they're right where the blood supply to the femoral head is. Um, there are three different areas that comes from. Most of the time people are going to say that uh, major contributors, the medial uh, femoral circumflex, which is the lateral epiphyseal artery, uh, the lateral femoral circumflex does also contribute some, uh, a lot less from uh, the uh, artery of ligamentum teres. So classifications, and I did forget to put one slide in here, and I'll just kind of discuss it. Is there a laser pointer on this? Yeah. yeah. What did I do? Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> so just in anatomical terms, we can talk about anatomical terms when it comes to hip fractures. Uh, subcapital femoral neck fractures versus transcervical versus basis cervical are things that we are told all the time when we're either called or discussing things amongst yourselves. Uh, this is the other type of hip fractures that I didn't go into, the intertrochanteric fractures and subtrochanteric fractures. There's also other ones, but those, those are ones that I left out of this talk today. Uh, one of the classifications we use, uh, poor reliability amongst people when it comes to this, but we kind of break it down into one and two, garden classification one and two, which is non-displaced, and three and four, which is displaced. We'll kind of talk about that more when it comes to indications. Uh, and what we do. AO classification, normally it's just a glancing slide that's on there for most of the time. I'll be honest with you, when we're getting called in the middle of the night, we don't want the AO classification of what you're giving us most of the time. Physical exam, so a shortly, shortened externally rotated uh, and flex position is usually where you're going to see these people at. Um, this is a good position for the hip to be in when we are talking about uh, younger individuals. So we're worried about the uh, tamponade effect of the blood supply. Now, in the literature, sometimes it's not well dictated whether this is actually important or not. But they do say that um, traction shouldn't be used. And I have that in another slide right after this. But that, that's the least amount of pressure is put on the hip in this position. So a lot of times, we actually want to leave it in that position until uh, surgery. Uh, radiographs and AP pelvis and cross table lateral of the hip. Uh, the cross table lateral is very important with these type of fractures a lot of the times, as you can see. Uh, middle button, I'm assuming? Yeah. As you can see right here on the AP, you may not see that, but on the lateral, you'll see that little bit of posterior displacement of the femoral head on there, which is uh, something we look for on something on the AP of the hip may not show. Uh, Preoperative considerations, like I said, uh, traction is found to be not beneficial. On the, if you ever look at the way the ligaments and the hip capsule work, it actually tightens with traction, the uh, intracapsular pressure uh, increasing with that hematoma inside of it. Uh, so treatment principles. So uh, in, in training, uh, I, where I trained, a lot of what we do is indications. Um, so if you do the correct procedure on the correct patient in the correct time, then you're going to most often have a good outcome. Uh, we had an attending where I trained uh, that said that was the biggest thing that we do. He said any monkey can swing a hammer. Now, I'd like to think that what we do is not just glorified monkey work but when it gets to that point. But he does have a good point, and that's what I said. you got to pick the proper procedure with the proper tools at the proper time on the proper patient to get the best outcome. And that's kind of where this dichotomy comes in, doing the correct procedure on which one of those patients and at what time. So the treatment goals, we're always wanting to mobilize patients. I know I've gotten uh, phone calls before by different varying people where they say, well, there's this 95-year-old in here. You're not going to do surgery. It's a femoral neck fracture, but they're 95. Well, that doesn't mean you're not going to do surgery. It's just a number. And even if they don't, aren't ambulatory, a lot of the times what you're worried about is bed sores, being able to sit them up, being able to mobilize them, being able to get them out to the dining room, things like that. So just because they're 95 and even lay down most of their life now, doesn't mean that you're not going to fix this fracture. So quality of care and morbidity, which is a big part, not just mortality, but morbidity of things is what we're worried about. And it's significant morbidity if we do not fix the uh, fracture the proper way. So treatment goals in younger patients, this is where that dichotomy comes in. So that elderly versus the younger patients, and again, it's more traumatic, more male. That's going to be the uh, uh, hip fractures in these younger patients. Uh, you're trying to spare the femoral head. Um, 
that has always been the goal, to try to avoid deformity and improve the union rate, optimal functional outcome, and again, that ABM, so lock and blood flow. Now, that timing to surgery, along with the capsulotomy, uh, or the capsule effect, where we want to get to it early, has not been shown to really, uh, in the literature, to be that important. Um, treatment options, limited role uh, for non-operative. Again, it's those with either very high risk in surgery or those that have very short uh, life expectancy at the time of the fracture. Treatment op options, reduction in fixa fixation, open or percutaneous, and then orthoplasty. And again, this is where that dichotomy comes in. So the younger patient, you must do fixation if possible. Consider surgical emergency, dot, dot, dot. Uh, there, the timing is not exactly well known, but it needs to happen sooner than later, uh, for sure. Once they're stabilized from everything else, they need to go to surgery. Um, closed versus open reduction with fixation. The number one thing that a good outcome happens with these type of fractures is uh, your quality of reduction. So quality of reduction, if you can get a quality of reduction by closed means, then sure, you can do that. But if you are whatever skeptical at all, then you should do an open. So closed reduction, this is just kind of showing how you can do a closed reduction. And again, uh, displacement more than five millimeters has a higher rate of osteonecrosis non-unions, which is some of the complications you can see in these people. Uh, the open approach, uh, the, anterior, the anterior lateral approach, that's the name for those two. Um, it gets you direct access to the fracture, reduce it, you get that hematoma and that tamponade effect and you can uh, evacuate that hematoma, get a reduction, and then most of the time it's going to be with percutaneous screws, uh, which are length stable devices. The other things that we can do, which are not, are dynamic hip screws or cephalomedrolae type fixation, uh, where it actually allows the fracture to compress. That's one of the things I didn't talk about, but that tensile compression forces is something we always keep in our mind. The orientation of that fracture, the more vertical it is, the more uh, unstable that fracture is going to be, the more stability it needs uh, throughout fixation. So uh, those uh, blade plates and the hip screws and things like cephalomedullary things uh, are more for the vertically oriented ones. These are usually for the more stable uh, fractures, which of course stability depends on reduction. So that's why that's very important as well. Uh, the cannulated screws, avoid any varus. That's one of the major complications if you get it into varus. And then avoid uh, reducing with the screws below the level less, lesser trochanter, otherwise you can get a stress riser there and end up with a subtrochanter fracture uh, at that time. So elderly patients, usually we lump them into hemiarthroplasty or, arth or total hip. Uh, I will say that uh, with the new functional scores and functional outcomes, most of the time, a lot of the time I should say, I'd say we gear more towards total hip, but there is increased uh, uh, dislocation rate increased blood loss uh, and perioperative complications, but then the long-term less revision and higher fa functional satisfaction scores. So it, it depends again on the patient's mobility, what they do for uh, in their life, how active they are. But in general, I'd say that community ambulators with hip fractures these days are gonna end up probably with total hip. And I, I would think um, uh, Dr. Bob or Dr. Dahl would agree with that uh, overall these days. Again, it depends on the patient, so patient specific. Uh, complications, osteonecrosis, uh, pretty high incidence. And this is one of the reasons that we try to fixate the younger group, but at the same time, uh, they have a high incidence of complication of osteonecrosis or hardware failure, things like that. And, and, and it leads to poor outcomes to those people. Um, in the future, with better total hip technology, who knows where the line will be at what age when we say, let's just do a total hip. Uh, it's kind of hard to say that at this time, but as of right now, the traumatic in a younger patient with femoral neck fracture, the standard of care is still over reduction in uh, at this time. And then non-union is probably the other uh, highest one. You gotta remember this is intracapsular, it's based in, based in synovial fluid, so endoscopic healing. Uh, it doesn't have that good callus formation, so a non-union rate is higher than in other fractures that we see uh, at that time, or in other parts of the body. Uh, other dislocation, we kind of touched on that, total hip has a higher dislocation rate than the hemiarthroplasty. Uh, mostly at the acute phase, as it goes on, it de does decrease. Uh, and then a very high failure rate, like I said, in the, in the fixation group. Um, and then revision hemiarthroplasty to total hip arthroplasty in those that are community <coughs> ambulators or those that have, are more functional uh, is a real problem. That's why we've kind of geared it towards that functional outcome 
uh, where we switch more to trophy of arthroplasty, the hemiarthroplasty, and the functional community ambulators, and those that uh, are more active, so with you know, intracapsular femoral neck fractures. Uh, I think that about sums it up.